The final speaker is Peter Gepping, who's going to be talking Interpreting Data for Action, the Application of Geostatistical Models of Malaria Metrics, and I'm really looking forward to understanding what that means. We negotiated it. Thank you, Gina. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So first of all, thank you to, to both of you for the invitation to come and uh, take part in, in this symposium um, celebrating Alan's legacy. Um, it really is an honor to be here, so thanks again. Um, so I'm actually going to pick up on, on some of the themes that have been mentioned by most of the speakers already in this symposium. Um, I'm going to talk about some, some of the work that we're doing at the Malaria Atlas Project uh, back in Oxford. Um, in particular, the development and application of, of a whole suite of different um, geospatial and geostatistical models, really to try and maximize the utility of information that we can draw from what are often imperfect data that arise from malaria surveillance in all of its different guises. So um, I'll probably surprise no one in the room by starting my talk with some maps. Um, these are actually hot off the press. These are our brand new um, updated uh, global maps of P. falciparum parasite rate on the top and P. vivax parasite rate on the bottom and the corresponding uh, estimates of, of changing burden through time for both. It's actually back in 2011 that the Malaria Atlas Project last generated global maps for the two parasites. So we've, we've done some interim updates for Africa. In the, in the meantime, but at the global scale, it's, it's actually been quite a hiatus. So it's good to have these out. These are now going to be updated annually on, a, on an annual cycle. Um, we're, we're doing them in collaboration these days with IHME, and this body of work um, forms the, the malaria component of the Global Burden of Disease Study. So that work is obviously pitched at the global scale. Um, what are the maps for? Well, you know, at the high level, they're for comparing at the kind of you know, national scale, patterns of risk geographically, so sort of spatial comparison, and also for comparing differential rates of progress between countries in, in their progress towards reducing burden and elimination. So they're for those kind of broad brush comparisons, and for that reason, when, we think, when we're thinking about the data that needs to go into them and the, the uh, methodological frameworks that we build to use those data, there's a very strong emphasis on comparability. So what does that mean? It means we, are, we will always favor data that are somewhat standardized. So if you're measuring something in one country, it means the same thing as that same type of data measured in a different country. Um, and ideally, we're going to be using data that are obviously widely available, data that we can get from most endemic countries in order to make those comparisons. So within Africa, that's tended to mean that we base all of our modeling on, on parasite rate. And Noor, Noor spoke a lot about parasite rate in his talk. Um, outside Africa, it tends to be API, annual parasite incidence, which is one of the worst misnomers in, in malariology. But essentially, API is just aggregated case reports, aggregated routine case reporting data. So the number of cases occurring in a, in a district or in a province or in a region over a year, and that's as reported by ministries of health. So that's our core input data set or type of data outside Africa. And both of these have limitations. Parasite rate, and Norway went into more detail so I can be quite brief here, um, we have this issue of latency. So parasite rate, it takes a long time from when the, a child is bled and RDT is carried out. So that data actually going through the, 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 sort of the process and becoming available for, for, for us as modelers to use, one year, two years. Um, so this is not a timely type of data. It's not very good for real-time monitoring. PR is also neither um, directly re representative of the intensity of transmission or of clinical burden. It's kind of an intermediate metric that's convenient to measure, but really doesn't necessarily tally with the thing that programs might be really interested in, in, in keeping track of. Um, there's also this issue that because it stems often from cross-sectional household surveys, um, there might not necessarily be the same buy-in to that data as a kind of authentic yardstick of what is happening in a given country, as opposed to data that the Ministry of Health is generating themselves through passive case detection at their, at their health clinics. Um, and it's also a, a bad metric when you get down to low transmission, simply because if you've got one infected person in a thousand, you're going to have to take a lot of samples in order to understand your pattern of, of infection across the country, so it becomes prohibitively expensive. And then on the API side, there's some very different but equally serious limitations that we need to be aware of, and these primarily relate to the, the fact that this is aggregated data. Okay, so we're, we're immediately losing a lot of the potential of the, of the raw data at the point at which it's collected at clinics by the fact it's just available in this aggregate form. So Noor mentioned a lot of the, the obvious biases in passive case detection. 
Um, one of the most important is, is missingness. So in any given district, a certain proportion of facilities in a given month just won't file a report or the report's lost. So there's lots of holes. If you zoom down to the facility month level, there's, there's lots of gaps in the data. They're completely invisible when you get the aggregate data. You don't know how much missingness there was. You don't know where the missingness happened. You just have this, this bias that you can't really contend with using the aggregate data alone. API are also poorly suited to low transmission settings where you might be interested in very specific focal points of, of high transmission within an administrative unit. And again, it's aggregated so you don't see that. It's washed out in the, in, in, in the aggregate. So for all these reasons, the, the data that we rely on for this global scale work, which has key advantages in that context, is really not necessarily optimal if what you're trying to do is support operational planning and implementation at the level of countries, the kind of information that programs might need on a regular basis to inform their decision making. Um, and, and similarly, it's, it's not very well suited in particular to, to low transmission settings. So, while the global work, uh, the global maps, the global burden estimation within MAP obviously will continue apace, we are also trying to develop in parallel a program of research which is focusing very much at the country level and trying to drill down and address some of these issues so we can provide more useful support um, operationally to, to countries and to programs. And we're starting this in, in the 16 countries that you see here. Um, this is working very closely with the Clinton Health Access Initiative and through them, um, working more closely with, with national programs themselves. This is all funded by the, by the Gates Foundation. So in those countries, we're trying to do two main things. Firstly, we're trying to get essentially better malaria, malaria metric data. Um, key amongst this is getting more granular surveillance data. So can we get reports of cases at the level of individual health facilities and months rather than aggregated up and, and at the year, an annual level? Um, and in some cases, can we get reports of individual cases and where, where those households are located? We'll also try and get any other metrics that may be available or may be useful. So serology is something we're putting a lot of time and effort into building up the analytical frameworks around um, to feed into this kind of work. A whole range of different entomological metrics, for example. Um, and we're trying to improve our covariates, the geospatial data from satellite imagery and other sources that go in and help us inform the patterns of risk of malaria. Um, it's a rapidly emerging, you know, hugely expanding field. There's new stuff coming out all the time. We try and stay on top of that and, and constantly improve our covariate library. So that's on the data side. And then to kind of complement that, we need to develop a much more diverse, a much more kind of flexible and responsive toolbox of analytical tools that can exploit all these different types of new and emerging data um, and use them in the best way we can. So examples of that would include improving the way that we can handle this aggregated surveillance data. Can we, can we get more information out of that? Um, models that can appropriately interpret and model the facility-based case counts, um, models around the serology and how we can potentially infer things like force of infection and how that varies spatially and temporally based on seroconversion observations in individuals. Um, and then importantly, can we sort of join all this up in integrated modeling frameworks so that whatever types of data happen to be available in a given country, we can use them together in an integrated framework and draw strength across the different metrics, which may have complementary strengths and weaknesses. OK, so just to give you a little bit of a flavor of how some of these tools look like and what they do. Um, where we have a situation where we've been able to get aggregate case data only, so that's the image on the, on the left, that's aggregated case incidents. Um, as I said, we may be interested in trying to pinpoint focal areas of transmission within those larger blocks. Um, so how is this possible from the aggregate data? Well, what we can do is take our um, very detailed geospatial covariates. So this is a very high resolution imagery and, and information about the environment, temperature, vegetation, et cetera, et cetera. And we can leverage the fact that there's relationships between those covariates and our incidence data at the aggregate level. And we can infer what that means for the sub-unit variation. So in other words, we can infer this pixel level, much more high resolution pattern um, that is consistent with the one on the left, but leverages the relationship with these high resolution covariates. So if we go one step down, and now we're dealing with um, uh, data on case reports at the level of individual facilities. So schematically, that would look something like that. Each of those green dots is a health facility. And of course, what we get are counts of cases, just, just X number of cases in a given facility in a given month. Now, as you can imagine, if you actually want to go ahead and model that, we need to standardize those counts. We need rates, right? So we need to infer a denominator population from which that case count arose. We don't have that data. 
We just need to do something to try and infer sensible denominators. Um, so the first thing we need to ask is, well, what fraction of people would have sought care from any facility? What's the pattern of treatment seeking within a given region? And we have a whole raft now of geospatial models to try and estimate and generate maps of treatment seeking rates based on data from household surveys, based on covariates, based on understanding of the transport networks that people would use, etc. And then once we have an idea of the fraction that would seek care at all, the next question is, well, which of those particular facilities do we think any particular person might have gone to? So we start carving up the population into catchment populations. And again, there's been a um, surprisingly uh, sophisticated amount of modeling that we've had to do to get that right. And I'll give you a demonstration of that in just a second. So we can put all these components together. Um, we can estimate our catchment denominators. We can standardize our counts and turn them into a rates. And then we can put those rates into our geostatistical spatial modeling frameworks and generate continuous surfaces of estimated risk, like the one on the bottom right. And then the most detailed type of data we could get is obviously individual case records. So the black dots here are actual cases and the households of residents of those cases. Um, and this is a completely different type of data, and it requires a completely different type of model. We can't use our standard geostatistical frameworks, which is built around rates. Suddenly, we've just got points on a map. They're not a count. It's just a location. So in geostatistical parlance, we call that a, a point pattern. And we use a, type of, uh, a fairly new type of geostatistical modeling called log Gaussian Cox process modeling um, to infer the underlying pattern of risk. What this graphic just shows is the added benefit of that type of data where they're available. So on the left, we artificially aggregated that data up to facilities, pretended we didn't have it and, and did some modeling, and we end up with a map like the one on the left. If you do have that extra granularity, you, you, can, you can drill out much more detail like we, we've done on the right. Okay, so finally, I'm just going to exemplify this in practice, some of these tools, um, using the example of Haiti. Uh, so Haiti, of those 16 countries that I popped up, is probably one of the ones we've been working in most intensely. Um, and also a lot, a lot of the most interesting kind of work in terms of the, the diversity of data that's available and so on. So this again is working very closely with CHAI um, to provide support to the National Programme and the Malaria Zero Alliance and thanks to both of those organisations for the consent to, to present this work. And we're doing things in Haiti at two levels. Firstly at the national level. Um, so nationally we've got now data from individual health facilities on case counts. We're applying these catchment models. We're doing this process of generating standardized rates, we're doing our geostatistical mapping. And I just want to use this to demonstrate um, why a certain degree of sophistication turns out to be really important, and that you, you, you have to be very careful with this type of data, and you can get very, very wrong maps if you just make, you know, um, if your approach doesn't have the necessary nuance, and this is something we've kind of learned by trial and error as we've gone through. So th this idea of catchments seems intuitively like it shouldn't be that difficult, right? An obvious assumption would be, well, people probably just go to their nearest, catch, uh, their nearest health facility, give or take. So you can just draw lines around the facilities and cookie cut the population. You know, everyone's just <laughs> keep doing that, sorry. <laughs> everyone's just going to go to their nearest health facility. So this is where we started. Um, and if you apply that type of approach, you can get a, a, an estimated population denominator. Um, you can use that along with your, your count from each health facility, that's the dots, and you can get a standardized rate. So the colors on that, on that map now show you the, the standardized rate applied using this crude catchment modeling approach. Now immediately, as a spatial model, you look at that map and you think we're gonna struggle here because there's no kind of organization to that pattern. There's no spatial structure jumping out at you. You've got red and blue, which are the high incidence and low incidence facilities juxtaposed and, and kind of speckled all over the place. And indeed, when you then take that standardized data and you try and use it in a geostatistical model, you come up with this very kind of patchy looking map, um, which you know, immediately doesn't tally with our, our kind of a priori expectations of what the epidemiology of malaria looks like on Haiti. So you know, it's kind of back to the drawing board. How can we do something a little bit more sensible with these data? And um, we've developed much more elaborate ways of understanding where people go to seek care based on a whole range of different factors. You relax the assumption that they go to their nearest, because it turns out they very often don't. Um, you acknowledge that different health facilities have different kind of draw capacity, have different attractiveness based on their size, based on the quality of uh, care that they provide, maybe based on the cost of, of getting care from a different facility, the transport network, et cetera, et cetera. And you try and take these things into account, and you try and then optimize your use of that type of model to work out what the catchment populations actually are. And when you do something like that, 
and apply the standardized rates, you, you get a map that looks completely different. And I don't know how well you can see those little dots, but suddenly you're far more optimistic because there's whole areas where all the facilities are blue, the, the standardized rates are low, whole areas where they're red and whole areas where they're in the middle. In other words, there's spatial structure and organization now where previously there wasn't. And when you go ahead and map, you get a completely different idea of what the spatial pattern of risk looks like in Haiti just by that change for the catchment modeling component. And suddenly that does make a lot more sense. You, the areas we know are the, the real problem areas on the island down in the extreme southwest at the end of that long peninsula, a place called Brandons, and that kind of wedge shape, which is the Artimonai Valley. Suddenly they're jumping out in the way that, that gives us a lot more reassurance. Um, because we're using facility data now that's by month, it's a reasonably modest extension to our models to develop monthly evaluations of risk. So we're really drilling down into the seasonality and the variation of incidents throughout the year. Um, and this potentially, depending on the intervention you're trying to plan for, is, is crucially important information in terms of timing of deployment of different interventions. So that's the national level work. Now, people who know what's going on in Haiti know that Grand Anse, as I mentioned down in the, down in the southwest, is, is one of the most sort of high burden areas. It's also a place where a lot, you know, some of the most intense activity, control program activity, is, is being planned. So we were asked if we could kind of zoom in one extra level to that, that small, smallish region of Haiti, and can we go to even more detail to support some very specific targeting activities there, and to exploit some specific data sets that were going to be available there. So I'll just very quickly run through that. So, so one thing we wanted to do was to improve this underlying map of population distribution, because that's one of the critical ingredients in getting this catchment population stuff right, and also in working out where your burden then lies in terms of the clusters of the population. So the top map was the, was the one we were dealing with. That's the open source World Pop project. Um, it's generally pretty good, and it's a huge advancement on what went before it. And that would have been our default. But we were able to augment that, because we, we had this data via the Gates Foundation from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, who had actually used satellite imagery to identify individual structures throughout the whole of Grand Anse. And then that was supplemented by a very detailed household enumeration carried out by the program and, and, and Malaria Zero. And we fuse those two different data types together in a model to redistribute the population. And you can see it's really different. When you get that very, very granular data on the ground, you get a very different picture of where people live. That's a very fundamental operational piece of information for the program to then plan what they want to do. We also were lucky in this particular place that we had some really good entomological data. So there'd been surveys of, of potential breeding sites and, and records of where we, we saw larvae and where we didn't. And we can take that, and again, there's a whole load of geospatial modeling that was required to get this right, but this is a map of the probability of finding uh, Anopheles larva in, in any given 100-meter uh, pixel in Grand Anse. There was a whole load of survey work from easy access groups um, on serology, seropositivity in, in, in children. Um, again, a whole load of modeling work that was done in MAP over, over many months to develop this map, which is um, estimated serial positivity based on that easy access group survey. So we've now got all these additional ingredients that we can put in. So we go back to our facility level case reports that are available nationally, but in this particular place we can add to that the population map, the larval map, the serology information, and we can put them all together in an integrated framework and now re-estimate incidents. And you can see just how granular we were able to get with all of those data inputs. So you've now got very, very specific and well-delineated areas of elevated risk in Grand Anse. Um, and this is then you know, fed back up via Chai and, and the program um, and is supporting targeting schemes for, for very specific interventions, MDA and community health worker targeting. So in summary, um, the globally available data that we base our global maps on are not always optimal for programmatic support. Nationally available data, um, when coupled with geospatial models, um, can support precise planning, decision making, precise action, even in low transmission settings. Um, and of the sort of new and emerging data sets available, I think by far the most important going forward will be this facility level case reporting. Um, and increasingly it is available. Um, surveillance systems are strengthening the digital platforms that facilitate that data, the assimilation of it and the dissemination of it, things like DHIS2, are, you know, the uptake of that is rapidly growing. This graph, the, the blue and green are countries that are actually implementing DHS2 or piloting it, um, and that map adds new countries all the time. So I think we can confidently predict that the coming years will probably see a pretty rapid increase in the quality, the availability, and the granularity of routine surveillance data. And I think it's beholden on, on us and anyone else in the sort of um, uh, analytical community to just be in a position so that we, we have the tools to maximally exploit 
these emerging data sets um, as they start to come into existence. So I didn't include my acknowledgement slide, which I'm very embarrassed about, but thank you very much to my group. Um, <laughs> th thank you to our partners and our collaborators, and thank you to the Gates Foundation.